Space communications. These will be among the main topics for dialogue. Material goods and, and money and things because that's not living. Hey Alex, how you doing, brother? Hey Daniel. Yeah. How's it going? Yeah, all good. Thanks. All good. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And uh, so, so where are you at, Alex? You're in LA. Are you guys in lockdown? Yeah, uh, L.A., I've been staying at my grandfather's, which is a little outside of L.A., about an hour and a half in this place called Hemet, which is just kind of a desert, no man's land. And, uh, yeah, it's been interesting, just the dynamic of everything, kind of, media and everything. So, uh, yeah, that's where I've been. Yeah, it's crazy times. Huh? I mean, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, and and where you are over in the States, there's crazy unrest happening. I mean, all around the world, but specifically in the States. Um, you know, are things starting to calm down over there or what's the what's the I, I mean, I, I assume you're probably looking at the media, which God knows what they're, what they're saying, but it's uh, it looks pretty bad over there. Uh, I had to stop. At, I had to just stop looking at it all because with the social, it just like became this like mob of like, do, you're not doing something right enough where you're trying to do the right thing. And uh, it was just, it was too, too much, you know, which is sad to say, but uh, yeah, I just had to take a break basically. And then just with also just the media and like how they just would twist the stories from what you're seeing on social versus what they're reporting. And it, it's really, uh, it's strange because you kind of just don't trust anything at this point. You know what I mean? And then with COVID, everything's changing day to day. And like, you you know, one day will be do this. The next day will be don't do that, you know? So it's really strange as, as we all know. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? There's no, there's no real one source. There's no real trusted source where you can go to, to actually get, you know, honest information. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, you see things on social, things on mainstream media, completely the opposite. Um, and then, yeah, it's it's. I think that's a problem that we're facing in today's world. The fact that there's, it's just a very chaotic, sporadic, and and yeah, really weird dis distribution of information. And there's nowhere, there's there's no sort of one place you can go to to actually get the truth. You know, so I guess you've got to do do a lot of digging and and try and sort of find trusted sources and, and do it that way online i assume yeah i mean i just think i think we're all trying to figure it out collect uh, like as a world the pandemic we you know so you have a lot of different opinions obviously so it's just going to make for congested confusing news so i don't know yeah it's funny and then you've got donald trump at the at the helm of it all which doesn't really help matters no not at all not at all. He's he just goes with his gut, with zero facts checked, and goes just head in first. So yeah, that that's another thing. I don't know. This place is pretty fucked, as as we all know. But it it's just like really showing its its belly right now. Yeah, the cracks have definitely come to the surface during the whole pandemic and and the unrest. You know, things are things have been pretty bad for for some time and it's all coming together now and sort of crashing in a way that's it's never crashed before so you know who knows how we're going to come out the end of this one but um it's funny i was just i was lucky enough to to chat to um to noam chomsky briefly last week um which was sort of re really nice for him to reply I, I got i got put in touch with him and didn't did, you know got his email of somebody didn't even expect him to reply and he we had quite a lengthy discussion over email and um and he was specifically 
<laughs> yeah, he, I mean, he was specifically sort of saying, you know, Trump is the worst criminal like in history ever. He's the worst in, in, in the political uh, landscape. Worse than Hitler, worse than everybody. And, and it sounds pretty dramatic, but he he was sort of saying that Trump's plan, or if you call it a plan, but his what he set out to do is to completely disorganize human life as we know it. That That's what he's trying to do. Um, and if you look at the patterns that are emerging behind all of the current chaos, you know, he's, he's t completely dismantling a lot of these arms treaties that we have. He's, he's really sort of looks like he's heading to some sort of nuclear war, which, which Noam Chomsky was saying, this is, it's a reality now, you know, we we're very, very close. And he's, he's making all of the, the, the moves that suggest that he, um, yeah, he, he's out there to start a war and, and one, one of which could be nuclear, which is, which is very concerning. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like I have zero, zero info, but I mean, I, you know, I, I would not, I don't want to give him credit to be that smart Trump that, you know, so you know, I really don't know. I don't have enough information to like form a, a strong, smart opinion, but I, you know, again, like I said, my, my, when you tell me that I'm just, the guy's not smart enough to do that, but he has probably smart people in his corner that know how to do that in some way or another. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I at this point, 2020 is a, just a big question mark at that, at, at this point, you know what I mean? Who knows what's going to happen next? You know, I think no one's even, you know, planning anything at this point. I think everyone's just <laughs> taking it day by day. Cause I mean, that's how the news is basically. It's just, a new it goes in it's not consistent you know it, it keeps going in different directions so therefore it's hard to predict what you can or it's hard to plan you know so so yeah i don't know i mean i hope not <laughs> it doesn't sound that like that assuring i mean he's also the idiot that will pull you know push the trigger without thinking so let, let's hope that nam chomsky is wrong yeah and and, um, and another um sort of point of topic is the one of uh, ecological in terms of a crisis which is also looming. Um, I was reading a recent study that was saying within 50 years, much of Southeast Asia, much of the Middle East and even parts of America will be underwater, which is pretty catastrophic. I mean, I knew, I knew things were, were, were bad, but I didn't, when you actually look at the detail in terms of where, you know, which places will be underwater, it's it's another big concern. It's something which Trump is completely ignoring. Um, in fact, he's doing his best to actually increase it in terms of the, the, the fossil fuel investment he's making, amongst other things. He's pulled out of all of the treaties, the climate treaties that, were, that were in place. And yeah, he's very much sort of out on his own. Well, the United States very much out on their own in com comparison to what yeah. the countries are doing. It's pretty worrying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh... I mean, again, just, it's, you know, I'm too small. I just feel so so kind of helpless and too small to really do anything. I don't know. It's almost overwhelming at the point where you kind of just surrendering. Like, all right, I, I, I don't really know how to, uh, how do you, you know, battle Goliath? You know, how, how do you stop someone like that? How do you stop that momentum? It, it's pretty... I, 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 yeah, I'm like a loss for words because I just don't even know how you disarm, disarm that that beast in a way. And, uh, I, you know, I, I mean, we'll adapt, you know. I, I don't, you know. It, also, I mean, this place is way overpopulated. And I know there's like a whole conspiracy of, of Bill Bill Gates and those 1% people like trying to, to control that. But... Uh, I mean, let's just be honest, this place is overpopulated with people. And so when I hear things like that, it's kind of dark for me to say this, but it's like, well, we need we need the checks and balances in place because mother nature has provided them and we've just figured out to outsmart it or just dodge it or maybe give us a little more time until it really takes us out. 
or takes half of us out or whatever it may be. So it's uh, it's worrisome, but at the same time, this is like the natural, you know, the natural evolution. And I think, like again, like I said, we're, we're overpopulated and we're we're re we're using the resources at a disposable rate that's just not not good for us or not good for the world so i think the world's gonna fight back soon enough and we'll be we'll be there to just watch and hope to survive yeah it's definitely the natural the the natural way you know nature's way of, of balancing and restoring i guess just obviously on a macro level you do feel helpless but then in a micro sense you know especially you you've got quite a lot of influence over a younger generation and obviously you've been very successful with skateboarding, also your fashion brand. And I, I guess it's, and I know you're, you've been in the past quite outspoken on environmental issues. And do you feel this, 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 or are you sort yeah. of actively looking at ways that you can leverage, you know, your brand or your, or your reach to sort of like make changes that may influence, uh, you know, the, your consumers or your, or your, um, your followers or whatever. Do you, is, is that something you're actively yeah. looking at? We always try to look at it in, in a way, but you know, the ironic part about it is it costs a lot more money. So a small business can't take the like the um, the steps to be progressive in a way because it costs so much equity to be clean or to reuse. It's you know it's funny because it costs more to recycle than it does to use new. And I think when I was in in Bali, I uh, I remember one of the talkers was talking about how we need to figure out a way to incentivize recycling. So bigger companies see the profit in that versus using virgin materials. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I try to, you know, I, it's just hard, you know, and we don't have like a production person. It's, it's either me or, my partner trying to figure out, you know, how to do it. And like, I want to move to cotton. I mean, sorry, I want to move to hemp because cotton is, is just so damaging and, and hemp has so many amazing benefits. It's, you know, it's like the, the wonder plant in a way. And so, it, you know, the, the short answer is we try, but it costs so much money. And when you're a small brand, just trying to keep your head above water, it's, it's not, it's not manageable, I guess, which is sad because it's unfortunate, but there should be like, I think Patagonia, I they, I know that they show all where everything's made, but I think there needs to be these maybe sister companies where they help do, do and they and they do have those actually like recycled cotton shirts, but it's just, I don't know. It's, you just need to have someone that has a very loud voice to do it. But I, I, you know, I just don't think kids really see that, you know, you have to, yeah, I think you have to get with, with age, you get gain wisdom. And I think with that, you can understand like, oh, well, that we all share this world, you know, it's all of ours or we all share it. It's that thing about growth, right? It's it's how growth and like the capitalistic idea is grow more every year and just keep growing and growing and growing and consume. Where we need to find a new, a, a new uh, yeah, completely new system, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the the growth of just of the cons you know the capitalistic growth of just keep growing and make a company bigger and bigger and stronger and just keep, you know, spending money and all that is just not the way it's just not sustainable anymore. That's, I think that's uh, like on a 1950s paradigm or 1980s even, you know, where it's just consume and it's, it's not, and we all, we're all guilty of it, of course. Yeah. I think, I think consumer behavior is something we, we, we need to probably look at, on a on a on a sort of right. bigger level, but but on the, on that subject of the capitalist structure, I was also just reading something a recent uh, report which which showed that after the two thousand and three SARS um, crisis, the um, the scientists the main the main um, 
I don't, I don't remember where they were from, but the, a group of scientists sent a report to the to the U.S. government, sort of saying post SARS that there will be um, some form of COVID crisis coming within probably the next ten years, and asked and, you know told, told the U.S. and and the world, in fact, to get, get to to prepare because there is something going to happen, and it was completely ignored because it wasn't good, you know, it wasn't profitable, you know, shareholders didn't agree. And, you know, the U.S. was sadly the, probably one of the worst or the worst country that that that, um, that was affected by it in terms of, you know, very slow and reacting, you know, no, no supplies. Right. Um, and again, it goes back to that, that that's capitalist structure of, you know, why invest now? Why spend money now when there's there's no there's no issue yet? It's kind of lining, you know, lining the, the, the pockets, the shareholders pockets, you know, CEOs, that type of thing, with very little concern over the over the future of you know the larger the larger group of people so i think there's definitely a fundamental flaw there it's just kind of you know we, i think we all know that but where do you go from capitalism that's a thing i mean is anybody i don't know if anybody's came up with a a really sort of bullet I, I think it has to i think it has to collapse to be honest to to see what what didn't work because if it works why fix it you know for some people but for most most Americans, it's not that you know, and I would say I I am a success story, but I don't feel successful in any any light. You know what I mean? I I know that I talk to people in New York, and I know that like the one percent of the one percent feel like they're not you know in New York they don't feel like they're doing well. You know, so it's it's a real yeah I don't know it's it's the that that kind of that false statement the american dream now i think there's obviously different versions of it and everyone has obviously their own ideology of of when they hear that but i think if you're someone coming from a third world country and you can make a business or get a you know a visa and send money to your family that yeah that's that's way better but i think the american dream is this kind of false false dream actually to be honest you know and i think my generation is really seeing the the repercussions of of what like the boomers are doing now and how their their actions are affecting us in you know more more ways than one and you know all they're all politicians calling the shots and you know, I think a lot of people my age are just kind of feel helpless or, you know, feel like they'll never own a house or, I don't, you know, just, I think everyone just like wants to grind it out. And I think that's also another thing with social media, which is really dangerous, is there's this false representation of success and what that is, you know, with people just, you know, showing, you know, celebrities, we'll say, because they're probably the highest influencers. And now we just have the word influencers, right? So people either renting Lamborghinis and acting like they own them and going on these trips and like kind of showing the best version of themselves, which is just not real. And I just think it's a really dangerous territory that we're going into and we're not, there's no uh, checks and balances in place and it could be really detrimental to the the youth or the next generation. Yeah, it's a very it's a very superficial yeah it's a very superficial world we're moving into, that's for sure. I I, I mean I'm I'm hoping that um you know that with the pandemic and all the the unrest that you know we do see positive change at the end of this and it, it allows people a new sense of space maybe to look inward and to really reflect on what it means to be human. Um, you know, reconnecting with nature and, you know, the, the things, the things that I see, a lot of things that you're doing, your practices. I mean, what, what have you been doing during the, the pandemic? I mean, I know you've, you've got your little rituals of, of sort of wellness and self-development. What, what have you been doing to keep sane during this time? Uh, well, I learned how to shape surfboards on the computer. <laughs> I, I, um, been making a lot of music or trying to. You know, I'm always trying to get better at guitar and then just have my, my like yoga, you know, 
do a ba basic asana practice and then into like a um, pranayama meditation for so it's basically like a 30 minute yoga practice and then 30 minutes of meditation and that's callable uh i can't even say it breath of fire um i can't say the sanskrit names at the moment because i'm on the spot but uh just pranayama basically and uh that's pretty much it cooking a lot as well and just trying to learn but it gets hard i mean i think you know after three months or two months you kind of just i mean i was i was surfing a lot too because they opened the beaches so that was something to do physically but uh and that kind of made made it all better you know for the lockdown but moving forward i you know it's hard to say i think a lot of people aren't going to want to go back to work you know what i mean i don't think it's it's strange i don't know but you know i think parts of us are going to be like well i don't really want to go back to that job and I found it hard to be motivated after a couple months because I had no incentive because it just was kind of Groundhog's Day and just kind of repeating every day. I mean, I was at like a kind of a retirement home with my grandfather and my dad because my grandfather is quite old. So we kind of had to take care of him during it. Or we still are. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, it just it's yoga in the mornings and then cooking and whatever trying to figure out just trying to learn pretty much whatever that is you know so that's what i've been doing what about you yeah i mean i've I'm, i've been i mean I'm, the the lockdown for me it's been i've just been trying to sort of focus you know my attention on on the, on the positives i mean i i well a couple of years ago now i kind of started my journey into just bring a lot more structure into my life in terms of self-discipline like my mum got really sick two years ago she I mean, she died sadly a year ago of cancer, and during that during that whole period, it made me realize how sort of mentally fragile I I was prone to being. Like I was just kind of, you know, obviously it's always a big thing to you know to, for for your mother to die die or whatever, but it, but it, what what it sort of forced me to do was really look a lot deeper in, into myself and go, okay, if, if I'm to get through this, how am I really gonna bring a bit more consistency to my moods and to and and you know just like general way of being, and I just. You know, from one day to the next, I was either feeling good or really bad, and it went on for a long, long time, kind of really crazy brain fog, and I just felt like I wasn't going to get out of it. It was a really weird period. And then then I sort of looked at my life a bit deeper, and I was like, well, actually, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to, you know, be as healthy as I can, but I'm, I always, you know, I don't really last that long, and getting, getting, do meditation, don't stick at it. You know, there's, lo there's lots of inconsist inconsistencies in my life in terms of what I want, really wanted, where, where I wanted to be heading. So I sort of implemented this new regime where, uh, of self-discipline self initially where I'd wake up at 5 a.m. every morning, which at first was quite difficult, but after a while it sort of turns into a bit of an enjoyable habit. And, and I'd dedicate those first few hours of the day just to myself, like complete sort of self-care, you know, deep thinking. Yeah. And, and just one by one, you know, added in the meditation. And then once, that, once I'd sort of locked that down, then started doing different breathing exercises and then like lots of like vigorous exercise, then studying, you know, then getting into the sort of ice baths and things. But so I've developed this routine in the morning. I mean, I actually get up at 4.30 now because it's kind of, it's, it's kind oh, yeah. of like my sacred time where there's no distractions, like nobody else is up, like anywhere. There's no lights on in the right. streets or anything. And it becomes this real sort of deep time where I can really sort of focus on on myself, you know, and 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 I've and I've and initially, as I mentioned, it was a, it was it became a, a bit of self discipline, but it just formed into a really enjoyable habit whereby I can't not do it now. So if I don't do the exercise or I don't do the breathing, then I feel like I haven't really started my day, and I've just seen really kind of like over slowly over time over the last two years, I've really seen some like positive changes, and that that's like and then during the, during the lockdown that's the one thing i've just focused on obviously with my family as well is, is a big part of that it's like okay like self-care like look after myself look after my family and then i just believe everything else will just sort of like take care of itself after that with the right intentions and so that so that's something i've been really focusing on and just getting fit get my mind body soul all aligned and yeah man that's that's been my real savior through all of this i think as long as as, as well as having my family here right yeah i mean I've been doing it for, I don't know, about four years now. And it seems, I think there would, 
when I first started, yeah, I'd feel kind of naked in the rest of the day if I didn't do it. And then when I would do it, it felt good. I think the biggest issue of waking up at five is when I can't get disciplined of going to sleep on time, you know, like being, yeah, it, it's, it's that, I mean, I was doing the 430 thing at one point and it felt amazing, like absolutely amazing, but I was, I just wasn't going to sleep early enough. And yeah, I don't know. It, it, I, I don't know how you do it with kids, you know, but yeah, it, it's just, it's difficult if you have roommates or anything, or if you live in a city to go to sleep early. If you're waking up at four, what time do you go to sleep? Yeah, I mean, I'm quite blessed. I mean, living in Bali with the climate and, and also I have two kids. So I put my kids to bed at nine and usually I'll fall asleep with them at like about quarter past nine, I'll be, I'll be asleep. So I go to bed pretty, pretty early. So that just lends itself to, to waking up early, you know, so that, that, you know, having kids, you, you kind of get used to getting up early, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, it's, it's, I think that's kind of a Kundalini thing. I, I, I don't know fully, but I think it's like stage three, like they wake up at 4.30 and like do these like cold baths and like intense breathing practices for I don't know, the teacher training, but that's like top, top level Sikh stuff. But um, that's amazing. I, I wish I was that disciplined. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty disciplined, but that, that's like next level discipline. Yeah, I mean, it feels good, man, because once you once you conquer it, it, it you, you, it's like you do it and then you, you start your day with a win because you, you, you know, do I do like a sort of fitness regime, I do do all the breathing. Once you've accomplished all of that, you feel like you've kind of had a really amazing start to the day. And you can sort of then, then you can go off and achieve right. whatever you want. That's that's the sort of mindset you're in, you know. And 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 those days when you really don't uh -huh. feel like doing it, you're like, oh, I'm not feeling too good or can't be bothered. Like when you actually just do it, just think, you know, fuck it, let's just do it. At the end of it, it makes you feel even better. And I think that's where the real growth lies. Like when those those moments of struggle, those moments of pain, and when you don't feel like doing it and you just do it anyway, that's when you start really, I think, seeing those those bigger moments of growth. And yeah, right. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I, yeah, I'm trying to think. I remember because I was doing a lot of Wim Hof, and uh, at one point I was going out with a girl, and I had just done Wim Hof. And when you first start doing Wim Hof, you start getting this like electric pulse feeling. I don't know how to really explain it, but it feels like electricity is going through you because supposedly by doing that breathing you create more current within your body. So that's what it, it's the current is going through your body and it has nowhere to go. That's why you feel like you're vibrating. But I had, I had basically, I had had that feeling a couple of different times. And I remember the day that we broke up, I had just gotten it and she came, came back and she's like, this isn't working. I'm like, Oh man, she's really like fucking up my high right now. Like I'm really, really Zen right now. This is not that cool to deal with. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I know what you're talking about, obviously, by just doing it and, and just being dil uh, doing your due diligence and just being focused and doing it every day. It really feels amazing when you get past that 30 day mark or 60 day mark where you kind of feel like you can't get stopped. But traveling will dismantle that real fast. Yeah, traveling is an issue. I mean, I try to travel as as, as least as possible these yeah, days. Like, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where I, you know, I kind of I try to get my friends into it, but it, you know, it's it's a self discovery, to be honest. Yeah, Wim Hof's powerful. It's definitely um, it's, it's it, it definitely works in terms of, like, it just makes you feel better afterwards. You feel like I've, I've I always feel like I've got a lot of clarity and and um, it just you just through the day you just feel better. There's something about it. And um, apparently, it's, he based his method on an old. I can't remember the name of it now. It's a it's a really old breathing technique, Indian breathing technique, whereby there's there's very, one called Tomo. Uh, maybe is that the one where they they're in like cold climates and they wrap wet blankets around them and then they they breathe, and the breathing heats up their bodies enough to then dry the blanket out. Uh, I think it's Tomo, which is uh uh. uh I think it's, it's, it's Tomo, yeah. I think uh, and that that's where it his originates from i believe i think it's a couple of different things but because i think he's the first guy to to uh 
translate Sanskrit in Dutch. I'm, I could be wrong, but uh, I think he's the, the first one to translate Sanskrit to Dutch. But uh, yeah, I think I think Tomo is is a Himalayan where they do it on the mountains and they 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 heat up their core so much that they can dry the towel or you know that's where you see the steam coming off their bodies in the in the silhouette and i you know it's one of those things where i started doing like where did because that's my introduction that's how i got into yoga that's how i got into meditation that's how i kind of that was like the the springboard because then i started i took his classes and i took his online course excuse me and then he came out with a new one and i was just like really on it and i was just like all right cool i'm gonna do this course too fuck it and i wanted to get certified at one point and i looked into it and i think you had to like you had to go to poland every year to like update your teacher training or i don't know how they how it worked but it was something of, of like you had to keep going to like pay and i was like at two thousand dollars two thousand dollars every year and i was just like that's that i don't i don't believe in that part of it but uh it just opened the door for like looking into other things like breath of fire and and tomo and i haven't really practiced tomo but i i know it exists obviously through the discovery of wim hof and i yeah i don't know he, he's he's a pretty interesting guy and uh I went to a, one of it, like a live course, but it, it was almost, it was kind of unfortunate because it was like so many people were just in awe to meet him. Where I was like, kind of like, all right, I want to learn how to like really do this correctly. But it was more just to see like the actor, you know, in, in the flesh. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone should try it. But I even got my dad to do the course, which was insane because... I don't think he would ever do it now or stick to it. How is your dad? Is he good? Yeah, he's really good. He's just, you know, losing his mind at, at Hemet with my grandfather because, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a weird time, you know, like my grandfather needs help, assisted living, but that's at the same time, you're like, well, it's kind of a death sentence if you put him there at this point in time. And so it's kind of like a weird stuff. We're just kind of stuck in this, like, holding pattern where you can't really move forward or, and progress in terms of like, you know, cause he just basically helps my grandfather and yeah, that's, that's been basically this year for him, but uh, he's good. I mean, we go surf and I know that makes him really happy and we've just been going to, you know, San Diego and, and San Clemente where it's pretty decent or pretty consistent you know and i think he's he's happy with that so he's in good he's in good spirits but he's always kind of happy go lucky and never really in a bad mood and um is your dad still skating or is he is he still doing any of that uh he skates here and there but it's never i mean it's not like aggressive like trying to get a photo for a magazine or anything he does it leisurely you know he does it on his own time but uh i mean during all this the skateboard parks were closed so we couldn't really go so that's why we were just surfing all a bunch and, and and what about your skating these days then like are you um what what do you i guess you probably haven't been skating that much during the pandemic i haven't i just i flew out to la to dj something and we were we were driving up and stopping at skateboard parks in in the beginning of march and basically as we were driving up the guy the promoter called us and was like hey it's not happening uh san francisco shut down so i'm sorry we'll do it you know in, in the fall or whatever and so we drove back and when we got back the whole country got shut down basically and so I haven't really skated since then just because I went out to my grandfather's and he lives at a kind of in a like gated retirement home community and there's not really anywhere to skate. So I haven't been able to really skate. And then also all the parks and you weren't allowed to be outside at one point. So no, to answer your question.
Cool, man. Yeah, I, I actually used to skate when I was growing up in England. I mean, no, obviously nowhere near your level, of course. But but one one thing when I was skating when I was younger it was in in the mid nineties in England skating wasn't it wasn't a very cool thing to do back then if you were like a young kid at school it was like you'd get beat up at school for having a skateboard it was kind of like that but but one thing which I really cherished about that whole period was the fact that like the community of people that did skate it was kind of like that was your crew and there was this real sort of sense of like community and we'd look out for each other everybody was from different different backgrounds and it was this sort of like almost an outsider type of thing and that, that 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 sense of community that we had i've never really sort of felt anything like that since and i don't know what what, what the skate scenes are now but 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 i almost I, I often look back at that period and think you know in a, in a way of that that that's what it felt to be part of a community and I, and I feel during this whole pandemic and everything that's going on we've kind of lost the sense of community quite a bit especially in the west um, and, I, and I'm just wondering, yeah. like, how, how we would sort of get back to that. I mean, in Bali, it's all life, daily life here revolves around community in terms of the Balinese culture. It's been completely, by and large, you know, it's been lost in the West. I assume that in the States right now, there's probably not that much a sense of community in terms of, you know, people living their own lives or whatever. But, but, but yeah, is, is there much of a skate, like, skate community still? I mean, or? the skate community is just kind of, I think, built off of maybe kids that are it's kind of like a tribe you know where say you move to New York you don't really know anyone or you're going to school there and you meet skaters you already have something in common right so therefore it, and if you skate you probably like X, X, Y, and Z as well you know what I mean you probably drink or you smoke weed or whatever and that just that there's that built-in community which is kind of amazing because I don't think people really understand but you know I I talk to my dad about it sometimes he's like you kind of can go anywhere in the world and you know if you meet a skater you kind of can you know be let in to some degree um and I don't know if there's really anything else that has that maybe like a bike gang i don't know not really but uh yeah i think s skating for instance there's nothing really like that where it has that community of of open arms where you know uh, someone could go to england and meet someone that skate and then they can kind of build a bond instantly from there and like become friends and like the, you know there's a lot of friendships that have been built in, built on skating from that and yeah, I don't know really anything else that really has that. And I, yeah, I agree with your the uh, the community. Uh, yeah, I don't I I don't know. You know, uh, if you come from a big family, I mean, yeah, I, the community thing is not something I'm like the the best with. You know, I I always always wanted it, but I'm not. I don't have it like that. I mean, I have my family, of course, but like the big community, like how you're explaining to me in Bali, where it's like an 80 person gathering of a family. I mean, it sounds like very anxiety ridden for me, but that's also sounds amazing as well. Because you were saying that you guys, you just talk, you like guys like bring it up like a town meeting, right? Where you're just like bringing up certain things and everyone's talking about their feelings, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very um like a family gathering over here. Um, it's like yeah, it's like eighty people show up to the house and <laughs> every like once a month or whatever, and and um, everything's out on the table. And I guess for a lot of people, will be like, well, that's that's my worst nightmare. But there's there's a lot of sort of rituals that go along with that, and it's and again, it goes back to almost like tribe like sort of ways of being where you come together and and there's certain things that you do, and you you know you look out for each other, but you also put all of the problems out on the table as well. So at the time, it probably is not the most pleasant, but actually I think in the in the longer run, it's probably a lot better for, for you and the wider community to be able to be open like that, you know? But I think in the West, that's yeah. not really how we do things anymore. I, I think it's just a loss of traditions, to be honest, or a loss of religions or spirituality, to be honest, because it sounds like to me, I mean, I'm only assuming that, but the Balinesians are highly, you know, super religious, not religious, but spiritual. I mean, religious too, whatever, which, which way you want to cut it. But 
I think that it's it's I think in America, for instance, it's if anything if you're outside of you know, any religion outside of Christianity it seen is is viewed as weird or different. And that's the problem and I think we, we, you know, I think we've we've ditched our traditions in some way. The good ones at least. There's some bad ones too, don't get me wrong. But but I think also with all the social media and it all tying back, I think people my generation are looking for maybe more Eastern philosophy or, you know, spirituality and they're they're more open to it because I think a lot of people grew up with zero religion at, at, at my age, so I mean, I can't speak for it, obviously, these people, but, you know, a lot of people I know never went to church. You know, I know very few, actually, but for the general consensus, uh, a lot of them just, you know, had no values, I guess. So that's where maybe it's lost, you know, and I think that's probably where the community's lost, but I think, you know... I, yeah, I don't know. I, I really, I, I wish I had a, 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 a correct, focused answer for you, but I think it's really just loss of, of, of spirituality, really. Yeah, I guess, I guess we're seeing a lot more people now, you know, getting into wellness, getting into looking after themselves, like a lot, lot more. Like the younger generation now, it seems, are a lot more in tune with that. And I think, I think you're right. There's this kind of like, if there's no religion, you know whether that's the right thing or not, but I guess it gives you a sense of purpose. And if you grew up without any sense of purpose, then what have you sort of got to live for? I guess. Yeah, it gives you a sense of morals, right? And it gives you a compass to guide guide yourself through it, right? So, and I mean, I guess we rely we were, we're supposed to rely on our parents for that, but you know, in other places, probably the community people rely on the community where the community, you know, it's, it's probably, I think it's all about, you know, American is like, it's a doggy dog world. So, or whatever country where it's like, oh, if I let this guy get ahead of me, I won't be able to like get what, you know, whatever job I want or car or anything. And it's, we're all bred to be competitive out here. So it's, it's really, I don't know. It, I I get kind of let down when I think of it, but yeah, it, it's yeah. I don't know. Sorry, I'm like like getting frazzled by thinking about it. It, it just yeah, yeah. America, America's just it, we're like extremists by nature. You know what I mean? We we came on, you know, we left England on an extremist view, and we're like, no, we don't want that. We want this, and then you know the rest of it is stealing and killing basically <laughs> and that's an extremist view but like you know it, it resonates obviously from generation to whatever centuries and we're still kind of built bred on that that like ideology i mean i this is just me speaking freely it doesn't it doesn't you know I, my opinion could change tomorrow so don't like quote me on any of this it's just this is the stuff i've been recently thinking about where yeah, which is the American are just highly extremist, basically, and it, yeah, it's just built on on this like that's been bred to be this, you know, build it better and make as much money and just this huge greed bubble, basically, which is just unfortunate. I guess it goes back to your comments on the on the capitalist structure in terms of that's what I guess that's what leads to yeah. that neoliberalism, and you also mentioned earlier um, about sort of sharing, and I, and I think that's you know as you as I can see your struggles, you know you, you're trying to move more sustainably with your with your brand. There's so many challenges there, and I think I think it was Patagonia that that actually made a bunch of fabrics and then. Instead of just keeping it for themselves, they then decided, okay, let's just make this an open format and share this with with everybody else. And I th and I feel, right. I feel there's a lot of people, you know, like us who are trying their best to really live more sustainably, 
you know, if you've got a fashion brand or, or, or you've got a company or even just as an individual, but just don't quite know how to do it yet or, or, or maybe the, or don't have the resources or it's just, it's just not that easy to, to get going. And I, and I feel like now's the time for us all to sort of like band together and maybe there is companies that can help, you know, younger companies or smaller companies get set up and, and, and move into a bit more of a sort of sharing style economy. I think, I think that's something which we should really maybe like consider looking at again. And cause I, cause I feel that's the only way that we, that, and that's, I guess that's tied to community as well. I think that's the only way that we're really going to sort of get out of this, that we all come together as one, you know, as the human race, as the, as the, as all the one big community on this planet. But like, we've all got knowledge in different areas, but we are so in, individualized where we're just off racing, you know, trying to grow our own thing. And I feel like we need to sort of press the reset button and step back and go, okay, how do we, how do we help each other out? And in turn, everybody wins, you know, the whole planet will hopefully be a lot better for it, but it's just, how do we get to that stage? That's the, on a, on a, on a, on a large scale, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, I, I mean, it just all that sounds like is just ego talk. Not you, you, but just like what what you're describing just sounds like it's you know man's ego that it gets in the way, right? Uh, yeah, the, the sharing thing's a huge thing, and I don't think we practice it. You know, there are those people that are just like givers, but at the same time, you know, it starts at a young age, and I, it you know. It's that thing of karma, right? And just giving and, and, and not like thinking of yourself. And I, it's something I don't, I would love to practice, but it's almost like I don't know, how, I don't know really how to practice it at times, you know? I try to, and you know, you don't, I don't think anyone likes to be selfish, you know, at times. It's something, it's just maybe it's a bit, they're blinded by their ignorance, right? So it's that thing of, of sharing and figuring out how to share and making it almost like, like our, our own practices, our daily practices. And how do you do that where you can do it with yourself and kind of have that inner peace. And I don't, I don't know how to, you know, I, I try to practice it, but I, I don't know if it's, it's a, it's an, it's not an all one fits all type of solution. So, and then, I mean, you're, you're, then you're competing with greed and all the other things that are surround it. So it's really, really hard. And I don't know, it's, I get very overwhelmed thinking of all of this recently where I kind of just shut down and I, I don't really know what to do, which maybe that's the right answer is just kind of taking a step back and taking a beat and just listening. I mean, that's really what we should all be doing right now. Yeah, I don't think any, I mean, none of us have the answers, but I, th I feel the fact that we're actually sort of sitting here talking about it, that's the start, you know, and other people will be listening and it, it does go, as you're saying, it does go back to like your daily practices. And then, you know, you then inspire other people to do those practices. Then it's like, okay, great. You know, if Alex is doing all this stuff, let's try it. Or, or people see maybe some, some people ask me on Instagram, like, oh, how, do you, how are you doing this and how are you doing that? And then we'll get back in touch a few months later. And so actually I've really been enjoying that meditation. Thanks for sharing it. And I think if, if, you know, it's just, it's just sharing what you can, you know, like it's even just a small thing of like talking about something, putting other people on the things, if that then starts their inward journey, you know, they tell their friend that starts their inward journey, then you'd hope that enough collectively it would sort of catch on and enough people would start sort of looking a bit more deeper within themselves. And then, and then, you know, I've, I mean, I've set up this platform space available to do exactly that. I'm like, okay, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a creative director, I'm a designer. But, but actually, you know, I've been searching for something with more meaning, even though I've been, you know, striving to, to, to work within sustainable design for a long time. And I, and I felt with the whole pandemic, there was kind of like, this is an opportunity where we can actually really step back and instigate some positive change. And this, this is why I set the platform up and, and I have no real master plan of like how to create change other than just talk about it, you know, talking to great people that I, I love and respect and get opinions, you know, get more knowledge myself, share that in the universe, and hopefully it will sort of transmit and enough people will pick it up, you know? So I think just by talking about it and sharing stuff, that's the beginning, I think. Right, of course. I mean, just making a platform, like you were saying, is is more than enough, you know? It, it, but yeah, I, I, it's just one of those things where I think a lot of us need to be told sometimes, you know? Um, I know I do, I sometimes, 
I'll read books where it's maybe a little too... It's it's more suggesting something where I sometimes just need like a straight answer and a rule book of like, this is what you do. And then from there, I can kind of make it into my own. So, yeah, I mean, look at doing doing anything helps really. So you're doing the right thing. Um, uh, yeah, some, but it, you know, it, it can get very overwhelming very quick and it makes you feel very small and you know, depending on your personality type. For for me, I I just kind of freeze and just shut down and kind of don't know really what to do. And that's what I was saying is just that maybe that is the answer for some where it's just like take a step back and maybe the answers will show themselves in another form. And, you know, I mean, you know, I think we all, we both have the right intentions. It's just how do you, how do you get that huge vehicle to like really make big changes? Yeah, I think, I think we'll get there. I think collectively the, there's a shift going on at the moment. I, I'm seeing more and more people, you know, waking up and, and actually wanting to like, first of all, just live a better lifestyle for themselves and the people around them looking after themselves better, you know, whether that's diet, nutri you know, nutrition, exercise, and then, and then looking at their lives and going, actually the life I was living pre COVID, it actually wasn't making me happy. Now's the time to actually try and make some change. So I think there's a lot of people sort of searching or, or maybe a little bit more aware of, of, of things now. Um, and I just hope that we can sort of come through this and really people can really start, sort of come together and collectively we can try and build new systems, you know, make old, make these old ways of doing things obsolete, you know, and, and let the, let the sort of companies the, or the big corporations see that change and hopefully they'll be forced into making, making changes as well, you know, if enough people get behind it. But yeah, there is challenges. I mean, I mean, I was chatting to, um, to Sital, who, who, Sital Solanki, who, has a company called Matter. I was chatting to her just a few days ago on the on the podcast before, and she, and she she deals with materials, so she's like a material expert, and and the majority of her materials are, are very very crazy, sort of futuristic um, types of things. So for example, you know, making like leather from coconut water, making different things from a lot of, a lot of it's very it's from nature. I mean, some of it's recycled and various things. And, and we were chatting about a lot of the sort of issues that or, or challenges that companies are facing like yourself, you know, it's like they want to do the right thing, but they don't quite know how. And, um, and it's just sort of, yeah, there's like a, a vast array of materials out there, which could really help designers or brands like yourself. And I just think there's the knowledge just isn't quite there yet. So that's, and, and that's one thing I'm, I think I'm trying to do right now is like connect people, you know, try and, Try and you know be some sort of source you can go to and learn about the alternatives and and quite often it's like if you're producing a leather shoe, it's not like a like for like oh we need to get a different type of leather. There's there's so many other materials out there that you could replace it with. Um, but then as you mentioned, it's just then well what's the cost and is it scalable and all these types of things and then we need to look at consumer behaviors. Maybe that's the answer. There's just so much there's so much different things. But I'm just right now I'm talking meeting people and trying to connect dots and you know i think the more people that do that with with good intentions you know i think there's going to be you know hopefully we'll see some sort of change you know I, yeah i mean i i definitely see it it's just the scary thing is, is how fast do we need to start reacting to it you know are we taking our time or is it going to be a tortoise in the hare story or is it you know i i, I definitely agree with you i definitely see I think our, again, our generation and the younger generation sees like, well, I'm not going to buy that because it's, it's, you know, it's trending to be like that. Um, and I think, you know, the more the merrier and I mean, it's, it's pushing in the right direction and I just, it depends. It's just like, we need those big, big corporate Walmarts, Targets, Monsanto's, those type of things to change but you know i think the world hasn't woken up but like the western world hasn't realized that like we can dictate how we see things with our wallet or how, how we, we can dictate things we can make things change if we use our wallet correctly and not buy certain things 
but um, until then, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, see it changing fast enough. But and not to sound like a Debbie Downer, I, I'm totally down for what you're saying, and I agree. But I think we 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 need to realize our our voting power with our wallets is really where we can see a lot of changes and big changes and fast changes as well. Yeah, I guess if you look at these the studies and the statistics, it actually it's it's an emergency what's going on right now the climate um unfortunately we're not really treating it as a pandemic as we are with covid like covid's obviously terrible people getting sick but we're you know we're going to come out of this you know like we're not good it's not going to like make us extinct whereas the climate crisis by the time the by the time something does hit let's say you know in 50 years or whatever it could be too late that's the that's the problem so it, it, i think we do need to shift i think as you mentioned are we moving fast enough if you look at the statistics i'd probably say definitely not you know no, not at all. But uh, but maybe that's just maybe we're the dinosaurs of the twenty first century for the next species to evolve. And that was like, oh, there was this time in in the world where they burned it burnt it up, and I mean, the, you know, this thing knows how to heal itself. So maybe it'll be the extinction of man. Unfortunately, I know that sounds grim, but it, it's you know we've seen extinctions happen in the, or at least we've been told about extinctions uh of the dinosaurs and stuff of the ice ages maybe this is the hot ages i don't know but uh maybe that's just that's the story of man you know what i mean and then there'll be a new creature that will evolve from it you know so i i or, i mean i think people will evolve like if there was that to happen there might be some weird evolution but like again like i said it's not it's not the end of the world. It's the end of humans, though, maybe. And I don't know. Or, you know, there's all these different theories. Uh, we were talking about, uh, what, uh, what's his name? Help me out. What, um, Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock. He's super fascinating. And I think he has similar ideas where do we come from? Are we from a different planet and, you know, got dropped off here? Like, there's all these different speculations or theories and uh, yeah i don't know i like it again maybe that's the hot ages and this is the end of uh, of humans i you know i just enjoy, kind of what i've gotten out of all of it is just enjoy right now you know and make the best of it and try to enjoy your time here because it's short and you only get one so don't don't get wrapped up in material goods and and money and things because that's not living you know seeing the world cooking tasting smelling things you know that's that's essentially life and i think we are missing out on that you know we're addicted to a screen looking at things from a screen's perspective instead of the real perspective and i think it's it's, it's a matter of just letting go and just being like, you know, what, I'm totally okay with being broke. I, I know, like just finding the enjoyment of, of certain things. But, you know, I haven't been confronted with that yet. So it's, it's, it's not for me to say, or it's unfair for me to say, you know, because I'm in a comfortable situation at the moment. So it's not fair to, to say that and not have that perspective. But I think owning a company and, and seeing that side of things kind of has made me appreciate the smaller things in life and understanding me like, it's not about having a successful company. It's not, you know, or being rich or anything like, you know, health is wealth, you know? So at the end of the day, it's, it's about just your experiences and like whatever it is doing yoga just being outside really and that's the thing that i think we've lost completely and so we we need to really get back to that at in many ways in one yeah i mean our inter interconnectedness with nature that's um that's something which you talk about quite a bit on the podcast and it's i think everyone or a lot of people now are sort of looking at that and going okay how do we actually reconnect because we've just lost our connection and we've just separated ourselves and and I think that's that nature does have the answers 100% in terms of like every and whatever you're doing. I think whether whether you're you know designing or you're just whatever you're doing in your life, I think looking at nature's systems 
that's the you know that has all the answers and as you talk as you mentioned previously about taking and not giving well that's that's nature you know everything that you that you you take you have to give back and vice versa and if you don't then that's when the the laws of nature then go against 